Welcome. My name is Jeffrey, and I am the Executive Director of the Asian American Writers Workshop. Thank you for joining us. Tonight's reading is the conclusion of a week of activity and engagement organized by the workshop and our friends at PEN America, calling out hate in all its forms and standing together in support of communities that have been targeted by a dangerous rise in hate and racism in recent months. We kicked things off on Monday with a public statement co-signed by over 100 writers, artists, and creative professionals, led by luminaries such as Riz Ahmed, Ayad Akhtar, Alexander Chi, Min Jin Lee, Celeste Ng, Viet Thanh Nguyen, and C. Pam Zhang. We asked everyday citizens to join us in calling for a more just, equal, and inclusive society. Today, we hosted a National Day of Solidarity, featuring free workshops, teach-ins, and now, tonight's reading. Poetry gives us the words we need to understand our place in the world. By rooting itself in paths of emotion and imagination, poetry has the power to take an all-too-personal experience and give it a universal context. Tonight, we are joined by 25 of our community's most prolific poets and spoken word artists. It is an incredible lineup of performances of verse and song, and I want to thank each and every one of them for joining us, not just tonight, but always in solidarity. And with that, I'll step aside and I will let their words take the spotlight. Again, thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoy the show. Hey, I'm Kelly Tsai, coming to you from my home studio here in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. Shout out to Asian American Writers Workshop and Penn for putting today together. Um, I hope you are safe and well wherever you are. Uh, this is a brand new piece that I have for you all. It's actually a song I wrote while in quarantine. The name of this song is Everything. So sudden in the blink of an eye, eye, eye fingers pointing accusations haunting for a fight who's the casualty of what they just don't know dragged far beneath ignorance's undertow who to trust? Where's hurt go? A day is a day, but is it though? Holding on to who fractured wings. This breath in my body means everything. How will it all end? The people long to know. We're all made. Human grasping for people. So many suffering, do our wounds make it plain? Heart stretched to the limit, hatred never breaks the pain. Who to trust? Where's hurt go? A day is a day, but is it though? Holding on to who fractured wings. This breath in my body means everything. Fault like stressed, stone thrown. Bloodthirsty egos guard their thrones. People lose ground, numb to the cries, surviving our lives, eat each other alive. They're taking a risk with someone else's life. They're taking a risk with someone else's life. They're taking a risk with someone else's life. Who to trust? Where's hurt go? Today is a day. But is it though? Holding on to fractured wings. This breath in my body means everything. This breath in my body means everything.
Hi, I'm Jenny Shia, and I'll be reading a poem titled Concealed Host from the forthcoming anthology Together in Sudden Strangeness. Concealed Host. Tuesday, again. The sap of the world is extracted through mesh and screen. What remains to be seen is assumed oxidizing inside the city's millions and millions of rooms. In the grammar of these times, numbers house bodies and streets grow with papillary blooms, white and eye pink. There are pains out of view, and for this we can move and see the needed footage. How are we to know in which direction the ending grows? The concealed host is the days wherein we age. Night brings a siren on top of the Empire State Building, but it isn't some metaphor for the moon. With our head in copious shadows, we brush the gleam out of the length of lives we once claimed as ours and ours alone. Hello everyone, this is Bao Fi, poet, spoken word artist, and father from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Thank you, Asian American Writers Workshop, for doing this. My poem is called Alternate Reality, or A Narrow Opening. Instead of a grandmother kicked in her face, a thousand orchids blooming from each swinging foot, the stems and petals forming a fragrant face mask wrapped around her face and yours. Instead of a man and his child stabbed in the face while grocery shopping, the knives turn to pens, sentences flowing like blood as the story of their lives filled the body of flag after flag, embracing the wind from every direction. Instead of acid poured onto a woman, we asked one another what our parents drank when they lost what meant the most to them. The lines on their faces a worn map to the unbearable, so they can find it even when they die. Instead of a nurse being dragged from a train, we all grow wings. There is no net big enough no handle long enough. Instead of a rock through a store window, there are no stores. We have everything we need and nothing more. Instead of fearing for my mother and father, they are hunched over sewing machines. The stitches even as the needles dip up and down, the thread light and tight on the margins, or it all falls apart. They sew masks, they save your life, and so there is no need for me to keep screaming how they saved mine. Instead of you chinks brought the virus here, there is a chorus and a language no one understood but translated as beauty so loud you were shaken and you learned the limitations of dancing, how you always been taught to dance. Instead of you people need to stop eating bats and rats, American history books fell off of shelves and burst into flames and we cooked our dinners for one another, burnt in some places and raw in the other. In the dark, our family's backs are hunched with all they can carry, dodging the spotlight eyes of soldiers, the bark of their guns off leash. They always escape the men with guns. We never forget. Instead of deportation, our bodies become boats. The ocean is impossible to border. The flags sink to a place where there is no light to see the sigils. We are all water, so we be like water. Here, mothers don't need dead sons or daughters before they are heard. The doctors and nurses don't need to stand in front of trucks as if they were tanks. 
We don't need to celebrate a day that a child isn't shot at school because that is every day. The drones drop only bread. The boots float meaninglessly over the necks of our fathers. The bigots are too busy with therapy to pay us any mind. The police bullets all miss. The hottest flame is in your kitchen. Lovers are never the chameleon color of bruises. You could lean down close to the face of the dying person whom you love and say goodbye to their very last breath. It's not science, but rather science fiction, that the landmines are not landmines, but seeds. And like flowers bursting from the soil after winter, you are an explosion in bloom. And our elders look at the grandchildren the way a person looks at the rainbow after a tornado has taken their home, bit by bit, away into the very same sky. My name is Janice Lobo Supigal, and my poem is called Against Guy Fieri. In Flavortown, Guy Fieri is judge, jury, executioner against young chefs and women. His commentary in acts against brown male chefs, cooks, see how smoothly and normalized the way he talks over anyone with an accent. He smiles to the side, spoils and finishes sentences he wasn't invited to start dips his pinky ring finger to colonize your sauce, your demi-glace, your remoulade, adding flat notes of alumni frat bro and flambéed fried over the top four vertical inches of burger, of foie gras, hair like a neon white isomalt, finger licking in crowded kitchens, paints the towns of middle white America and Baja California and Puerto Rico, subjects your mom and pop to a military of cameras and celebrity guests riding around a driver who dines in. A Camaro is a fiction. A Camaro is a corporate, fictional, made-up word, a small, vicious animal that eats nothing. And dives have always been a part of working class culture, existed long apart from exploitation against conglomerate mincing of small business sugar. Guy Fieri is a sunglass tan line. Across the face looks like the kind of man who refers to undershirts as wife beater. Looks like the kind of man who calls himself a minority in a Mexican, Ethiopian, Filipino kitchen, most likely to scab, to make you put ice cream in your marinade, plays games with your food while people are sweating, starving for a paycheck, quadruple your prize money, mansplaining your family recipes, and cutting a knife through your California dream. In the case of the people versus the open collared red flame shirt, pop culture, punk rock looking like if a chef was a race car, stick a smoke in him, don't second guess when I count to three, this food network showmaker, this culinary gangsta, this white knight of caricature touches everything, your noodles, your mies, your small town, your bread, what kind of big baby, what food chain, what decay eats your food right off your plate. Hey y'all, my name is George Abraham. Um, I'm going to be reading a poem today as part of PEN America and the Asian American Writers Workshops uh, program um, confronting anti-Asian bigotry during this pandemic. Um, I'm going to be reading a poem today from my book Birthright um, that hopefully stands in solidarity with folks during this time. Auto translations of surveillance. To call the Florida suburbs our first lesson in loneliness. The only house on the street to hang a flag that betrayed us because everyone hangs that flag here. To hang the colonizer's god around our necks to call salvation. To call it survival. To assemble from every charred scripture a word to call God. To partition the mountains of a land to call holy. To build them into sniper towers. To birth a police state and divinity in the same breath. 
to inherit drought in unfamiliar currency, say, water is, only, is always holy once the well dries. To inherit drought in unfamiliar currency, say, every iris is an ocean we refuse to drown in. To follow me on Twitter, say, I really like your poems, to watch list, to track Facebook videos of unarmed Palestinians being shot as predictive policing, to pass on to everything your palm grazes, your oppressor's eyes, to Midas, touch, to pray God watches over his people, to sing God watches over his people, to love a land so much you could never trust that water. To torture via water, starvation, sleeplessness, confinement to coffin-sized boxes. To perceive every second as faster than the one that preceded it. To approach death in monotonic velocities. To carry the names of CIA torture victims in your family, yet everyone carries those names here. To respond, Florida, USA, when the Tel Aviv checkpoint guard asks where you're from. To be asked, are you sure, despite... To inherit a geography to call American and exist in the contradiction of it. To write this poem two oceans east and be called illegal. To unname Darin Tatur from this poem. To bleach Edward Said's name from every tenure track. To inherit a tongue of restless death and lexicon, a rolling in our graves type of immortal. To disappear sobbing into a plate of falafel until it becomes Israeli to salt and conquest, to understand space only through finite partitions, to claim any death as before our time and exist in the crossfire. It was a death. It was a door. A light to exist in the moment a bullet intersects the skin at the border of three time frames simultaneously from the coordinate frame of a gun. Every bullet is an exile spat out of its country. From the frame of a country, every one is a gun to be bullet filled. From the frame of the bullet, there is no home aside from the torrid air that lifts it to exist at once as both object and verb in every tense. To pass on to our children this inherited paranoia, anxiety, its collapsing time scale, hence making the police stay timeless, hence God. To laugh after being put on a watch list, say, finally, you fuckers. To be a laughing in God's face type of immortal. To lean into the light. As if it was jealous enough to take us back. As if we weren't ancestored before even drawing our first breath. Hello everyone, my name is Arya Eber. I'm a poet and I'll be reading a poem from my book, Heart Damage. Avron Funeral in Paris. The aunts here clink Malbec glasses and parade their grief with musky, expensive scents that whisper in elevators and hallways. Each natural passing articulates the unnatural. Every aunt has a son who fell or a daughter who hid in rubble for two years until that knock of officers holding a bin bag filled with a dress and bones. But what do I know? I get pedicures and eat croissants while reading Swan's Way. When I tell one aunt I'd like to go back, she screams, it is not yours to want. Have some cream cheese with that says another. Oh, what wonder to be alive and see my father's footprints in his sister's garden. He's furiously scissoring the hyacinths, saying all the time when the tele-researcher asks him, how often do you think your life is a mistake? During the procession, the aunt's wails vibrate, wires full of crows in heavy wind. I hate every plumed minute of it. 
God invented everything out of nothing, but the nothing shines through, said Paul Valéry. Paris never charmed me, but when some stranger asks if it stinks in Afghanistan, I am so shocked that I hug him, and he lets me, his ankles briefly brushing against mine. Thank you. Aloha, my name is Ishul Yi Park, and I'm reading this poem to my daughters during a time of COVID. Aloha, my loves. We are living through strange times right now. Our neighbors walk around muffled and masked without even the comic relief of capes or swords. And when they call you mellow yellow, piss yellow, chink, and try to poison you with arrows of their hate, surround yourself with a force field of love and the protection, blessings, prayers, psalms of your ancestors. Sharpen those arrows and know how to defend yourself against men and beasts who try to harm you. And remember what your mama said. Do not trust the words of folks who do not love you, who try to make you feel less than so they can feel greater. Remember, loves, your skin is luminous, color of Kona sunsets, Maui pineapple, and pure Lehua honey. They wish they had your shin. They secretly covet your glowing skin, color of tapa, color of blooming sunflowers, color ripe corn of wheat fields and barley, your skin like the velvety sand at Secret Beach in Kauai, your skin glows with life, your soul is deep, your life is a precious taonga, all of our lives are divine gifts from our creator, some will try to make you feel as if your offering is not as great because the packaging is not as shiny or rich. They do not know that wrappings and covers mean nothing in the eyes and heart of the Most High who peers deep into the soul of beings. So what can we do to maintain peace in times of chaos? (sighs) Breathe. Be you. Use your hands to plant. Sew masks. Tend to gardens. Create bouquets. Paint landscapes. Remember the words of Auntie Alice Walker. Hard times require furious dancing. And our classiest first lady. When they go low, we go high. You know that we could touch the sky, we're gonna sing our song to keep us calm. You know they're just a napunya. <laughs> plant seeds of aloha as we plant our seeds of kalo, maia, and ulu to nourish us. Plant your feet barefoot. In rich dark soil, fingers, in spilantis, lavender, and orchid. My body is a prayer, a song, a vessel, a canoe for hula, for aloha, for akua. My life, deep and wide as ocean, my memories, stars in the mist, to my angels. Christmas and Easter blessings, spinning and singing and navigating this strange and dangerous world with hearts bright as fireflies. Remember, loves, we are the young magicians. When the goblins and masked zombies come out, remember, love spells are stronger than curses, and aloha is always the answer. (laughs) What we have is us. What we have is love. This is what we have. What we have is us. What we have is love. Aloha. Stay safe and happy. 
Be kind to all your Asian American brothers and sisters and everybody in the world. Sarangha. Love from Hawaii. Chihu! This is what we have. Yeah. What we have is us. What we have is love. <laughs> See, this is what we have. This is, this is what, what we, we have. What we have is us. What we have is us. What we have is love. <laughs> Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> Hey, I'm Jenny Zhang, and this poem is called Great. Great. Your daddy won't log off. He lives to make women carry eyelashes in their tummies. All that time my twat was suspended in fluid must have really made me gummy and flexible. It is absolutely true some people go to their graves without coming to terms with the harm they've caused. Is there anyone who doesn't have at least some figure in mind standing in for what they are owed? I did not mark the notabilia of your mother's house so ornate and delirious with collecting. As a person often mistaken for an object, I did not think to behave with human dignity. Instead, I crawled sluggishly, like I had been salted in broad daylight. Slabs of my skin pounded into gold, sprinkled across your antique wallpaper. Should anything happen, you can take to your legacy publications, and I will go online again. I know how much you disagree with my value. All that interest is just puffery until it threatens your family line. Don't think I don't realize who Ancestry.com has been scamming. When I speak in the first person, it's memoir. And when you do it, it's a commencement speech. Well, you can't uninvite me to that Facebook group, Harvard Memes for Horny Bourgeois Teens, then lecture my people on the artlessness of confession. We laugh at you behind your back, you know though it doesn't affect your balances. You can barely keep up with the acronyms and still you are paid for photographing salad. And I waste hours screenshotting receipts. No wonder my family turned violent. No wonder they didn't believe me when I announced I would tend to roses, live a quiet life, mostly inside except to water. Go home, go home, go home, go home, go home, go home, go home. I heard the song, and I know the law. Sure, I won't last long. And my legacy is uncertain. Death or history will dispose of me perfectly. You're on the wrong side of history, types the daughter of a colonizer who invites me to dinner after I get published in her daddy's paper. I accept graciously and then go straight into hiding. Hello, this is poet Marilyn Chin, and I shall read a very beloved poem, and it's called The Floral Apron by Marilyn Chin. The woman wore a floral apron around her neck, that woman from my mother's village with a sharp cleaver in her hand. She said, what shall we cook tonight? Perhaps these six tiny squid lined up so perfectly on the block. She wiped her hand on the apron, pierced the blade into the first. There was no resistance, no blood, only cartilage, soft as a child's nose. A last iota of ink made us wince. Suddenly, the aroma of ginger and scallion fogged our senses. 
and we absolved her for that moment's barbarism. Then she, an elder of the tribe, without formal headdress, without elegance, deigned to teach the younger about the Asian plight. And although we have traveled far, we must never forget that primal lesson on patience, courage, forbearance, on how to love squid despite squid, how to honor the village, the tribe, that floral apron. Thank you, everybody. Please be safe. My name is Joseph Legaspi and I'm reading a poem titled, This Face. This Face. Eyes like magpies in milk, the caves of the nose, lips, the darker petals of pink roses. It is a face of an Asian. Derived from the Malays, the hunters in Java, the Chinese, cooling themselves in the banks of the Yangtze, it is my father's face. Asian men. In America, it could be another word for mule, the sterile, almost female, the gook nips and flips, who cook beautiful meals with bean sprouts, cashews and water chestnuts, who slice their meats in slivers, who eat food with sticks like slender fingers, who do laundry for a living, who are passive, who are more cerebral than sexual, who are prisoners of their genetics, the undersized soft frame, almost hairless bodies, the mongoloid features. I see the face that looks back at me, the porcupine eyebrows, the furrow of the forehead, the overbite, same as when I hunch over a basin of water, as when I close my eyes to sleep. It is the face of someone who is the source of my conceit, my Asianness, my maleness. It is my father's, and I love it. My name is Adiba Shahid Tanukhtar, and I'll be reciting my poem, Mirror of the World. Mirror of the World, after Fez Ahmed Fez. When the crescent pierces the soft of it, the afternoon bursts, forlorn despite its light upon light. I ask, Whose blade is sharpest? Who holds the sky today than tomorrow? To whom belong the flames at night? Is it your lovers, O oh beloved, or the executioners? The breeze wakes us from the dark, whispers. If the wounds are blooming, the roses will too. Hi, my name is Paisley Rechtal. I'm gonna read a poem based on an immigration questionnaire given to Chinese claiming to be former US residents or for Chinese entering the country during the Chinese Exclusion Act. It's called Have Knowledge. Have you ridden in a streetcar? Can you describe the taste of bread? Where are the Joss houses located in the city? Do Jackson Street and DuPont run in a circle or a line? What is the fruit your mother ate before she bore you? How many letters a year do you receive from your father? Of which material is your ancestral hall now built? How many water buffalo does your uncle own? Do you love him? Do you hate her? 
What kind of birds sang at your parents' wedding? What are the birth dates for each of your cousins? Did your brother die from starvation, work, or murder? Do you know the price of tea here? Have you ever touched a stranger's face as he slept? Did it snow the year you first wintered in our desert? How much weight is a bucket and a hammer? Which store is opposite your grandmother's? Did you sleep with that man for money? Did you sleep with that man for love? Name the color and number of all your mother's dresses, now your village's rivers. What diseases of the heart do you carry? What country do you see when you think of your children? Does your sister ever write? In which direction does her front door face? How many steps did you take when you finally left her? How far did you walk before you looked back? Winter mornings, I'd wake to my parents murmuring downstairs, their voices not gentle, but following the natural flies of their own deer. Waking, knowing no one would come up, but some days I would be called from the bottom of the stairs. Just my name in a dialect that no one in this town spoke, not even the people who looked like us that it was time for school, that they were leaving, but that they'd wait for me. How embarrassed I was for them to sound of a country that only we knew. Years later, I sat on a bus with a girl who was born here. We'd known each other a year, but only alone could we have asked ourselves where we were really from. Then struck, lightning through our fawnish mouths, having reached the same province we both weren't willing to seek or reveal. Grateful for those mornings in bed, hearing my mother at the foot of the stairs, even though I couldn't reach her. Hi, I'm AJ Ko, and I'm reading a passage from The Magical Language of Others. This is a part where my grandmother Kumiko has sort of chosen where to have her grave. Despite her longing, Kumiko chose to rest in California. Her grave was cleared of weeds pulled by the workers she had greeted herself the previous year. Maybe she wanted to be close to her family, buried in the country, chosen by her children. As I learned Japanese, roam through Ueno and the elevator of that ryokan, I learned to isolate myself through language, from English to Korean to Japanese. It was so effective, it was frightening, as if I could guard against others like a spy where I could hardly open my mouth before. It now seemed that no one could speak to me. Languages, as they open you, can also allow you to close. When I felt myself running towards seclusion, I heard my grandmother and my great-grandfather urging me to try, and how much harder one must try when learning to love. She never asked me to speak, but to understand, rather than endure to forgive, and never to sacrifice, only to let go. Thank you. Coronavirus Mapping by Craig Santos Perez. Even on maps, tracking the pandemic, Pacific Islanders are invisible, as if quarantined from sight.
Hi, I'm Monica Yoon. Um, I wanted to read a poem that I wrote earlier this year, thinking about the profound cynicism of anti-immigration, um, about how so much of what we think of as particularly American, the transcontinental railroad, um, the agricultural system, the healthcare system, the childcare system, even, even our meat, so often depends on the labor of immigrants, um, often immigrants who are less than fully citizens and who are treated as less than fully human. So this poem relies on the two definitions of the word leave, both leave as in to put forth leaves and also leave in the Brexit sense um, to get out of here. Leave. Because it is to create an acute angle an angle shaped like a wedge, because it is to give birth to what you already know to be expendable after it is cleaned, after it is fed you, because you are enriched by even its deterioration, because the join might seem slender like a throat, because the bud might seem tender like a bud, but in this tenderness you do not share. You do not share anything, because even the join is also a jam a harbinger of scab, a rust-red portal that shuts down what it depletes, that shuts out the obsolete, because you keep what is inside from seeping out, because you keep what is outside from slipping in, because in the singular and as a noun, you are a form of formal permission, as in why don't you make like a tree and... Thank you. Hi, my name is Monica Sook, and I'm the author of A Nail the Evening Hangs On. I'm going to read a poem from the book called Cruel Radiance. I take the R from 86th Street to teach poetry in Manhattan. My hands sweat on cruel radiance. The front cover, photograph of a girl the Khmer Rouge executed. One of many children presumed counter-revolutionary enemies as the soiled descendants of such. My chest heaves. To everyone on the train, I do not say all the sobbing inside of me. All of it you know now, but you don't know what I am called. Aneka Jun, traitor of my roots. Instead, I catch the N across the platform, continue reading about S21. We were not inside those prisons. They were. Our hells almost certainly are not theirs. A white girl with a streak of blue hair falls flat on her back, her head a bowling ball close to my foot, her head a bowling ball that rolls on the floor. I look up from reading cozy existential atmosphere, Adorno's words, and there, a white girl on the ground, breathing, breathing, breathing. Someone call 911. Someone press the emergency button. Someone pull the girl up. Now she is sitting, telling someone she's on her way to 23rd Street as a train screeches to my stop on 8th. Doors open. I see how the distinction between victim and executioner becomes blurred. I want to cancel class. Because why? So I can sob about the killing fields and how Aneka Jun feels? I'd rather do that today. My head could be a bowling ball too. I could fall over from this too. Thank you. My name is Kazim Ali, and I'm going to read to you a poem called The Astronomer. It's from my book Inquisition. And it goes like this. Adamant in his argument against winter, he plots the distance to the horizon by graphing the shape of a tree against its green, calculating the sum of the wind when yesterday is taken from it. 
His azimuth splendor maps the city twice in time, and he feels the drag of the tide pulling him along the millennia into other cities, each of which existed here in this same place. Afternoon, in sunlight, he climbs up the mountain and arrives at the flower gate leading to the garden on the slope, there being no more resistant surface upon which eternity could make its useless claim. That the prayers he learned all his life mean no more to him. Thrust up from the dark of the earth only to wither, how are flowers in any way supposed to understand God? They are no better than a human body that seeds and sprouts and dies. And even if a body were to remake itself or rename itself as different matter, what would it matter? Briefly, he wonders then, is he a river furiously plotting a course or the boat floating down or the person inside? No mathematics can plot the path from a body that doesn't exist to a city that doesn't exist. The storm won't abate. Its numbers irrational, tempers extreme, like that of another poet mathematician who lived a thousand years back, or maybe one who lives a thousand years on, drawing patterns in stone to cut for tiles, piecing together a map of the universe, seven small planets, swinging their cosmography of charlatan destinies. Is that his future or history unmapped? He remembers that the sage Ali warned the astrologers to cease telling fortunes, not on account of potential infidelity, but because the book of the stars was impossibly infinite, and so many bodies were yet unseen and uncharted, that any divination risked planetary imbalance. And so he never knew which of the unknown constellations truly governed his kismet, Fairy prince, lonely brother, angry son. At any rate, stubborn as a volunteer, he appears in the flower beds, and annually he clamors to be, along with the hyacinths, tulips, and orchids, gathered and carried to portal adornment. He broke his way through the glittering dome by guts and calculus, that science meant to plot the relationship between different objects unspeakable that move through the cosmos at varying speeds. In the kingdom of heaven, the belt of Orion is no belt at all, but stars separated by galaxies and light centuries. His hands on the bars of the garden gate grow dark in the dimming light. And suddenly he understands. The horizon is not the end of the world, but like God and the unfound planets, it is only the end of his knowing about the world. Like that call to prayer, unspooling its rebuke over silver-leafed olives and cypresses on the way down to make its unresting vow to the blue devastation of the unbound sea. I'm Emily Lee Luan. This is my poem, I swam in a cold lake and then watched my body convulse on shore. I swam in a cold lake and then watched my body convulse on shore. I looked at my body, a flight attendant's body. 
one of the ones on a Chinese airline. I watched them last time I was on an international flight, their skinny arms and flat chests, their clean sense of purpose. I had an aisle seat, and they bumped my elbow with the beverage cart, said sorry to me in two languages, both of them mine. I thought I could be a flight attendant, and in another life, I might have been. My cousin is a flight attendant on Eva Air. My other cousin, born three days before me, who wants to be a model, tried to be a flight attendant instead. She didn't get it, said there was too much memorization, and she couldn't remember everything. I secretly know I'd be a great flight attendant. I could discreetly close the overhead bins, twist my hair back, tie the service apron on, hand out hot towels, blink my eyes big, say tea tea cha cha all the way down the aisle. When offering small sandwiches, I might stare out of one of the windows, imagine the ocean blue. Or say, when cleaning up a toddler's vomit, I might yearn for a less solitary life. But otherwise, loneliness might be okay when surrounded by other flight attendants in the sky, my body a body made, pretending to bodies in flight. I breathe in the air of neither here nor there. I'd remember everything about my lives on Earth. Hi, my name is Franny Choi. Um, this is my poem. It's called, We Used Our Words, We Used What Words We Had. We used our words. We used what words we had to weld. What words we had, we wielded, kneeled, we knelt and wept. We wrung the wet, the sweat. We racked our lips. We rang for words to ward off sleep, to warn, to want ourselves, to want the earth. We mouthed it, wound our vows until it fit. In fits, the earth we mounted, roused and rocked. We harped, we yawned, and tried to yawp, and tried to fix, affixed, we facted, felt. We fattened, fanfared, anthemed, hammered, felt the words worth stagnate, snap in half, in heat, the wane, the melt, what words we'd hoarded, halved, and wholly porous. Meanwhile, tied, still tied, and we still washed for sounds to mark, and marked. Thanks. Hi, my name is Haladian, um, and I'm going to read a poem today. This is called, When They Say Pledge Allegiance, I Say. My country is a ghost, a mouth trying to say sorry, and it comes out all smoke, all citizen and bullet and seed. My country is a machine, a spell of bad weather, a feather lacing my mother's black hair. I mean her dyed hair. I mean her blonde hair. I mean her hair matches my country, so shiny and borrowed and painted over. My country is a member, like it is 1948 and my great-great-grandmother flattens bread with her hands while my other great-great-grandmother prays with her hands. One watches her land disappear. The other builds a house on land that will disappear. My country is an airport line a year of highways, an intermission. My country is Stockholm Syndrome, is immigrant mouth saying thank you, saying please, saying my country is no country but ghost, is no man but ghost. My country is dead. My country is named the dead. Give them their salt. My country is a mouth trying to say pledge and it comes out all salt. My country is a mouth and nobody can pronounce my name. I mean, my country forgets my name. I mean, my country is always asking for my name. And I'm always saying it twice, spelling it like an address. My country is a number, like 
It is 1967 and every Arab leader is crying. Every mother is clutching the son she has left. And my great grandmother names my mother nostalgia while my great grandfather names my father a gun. My country is all ghost. My grandmother is all ghost. My grandmother is a country. I mean, my grandmother is my country. I mean, my country is a lie, is an emptied house, is 1,000 cardboard boxes. My country is remember when we left Akka? I mean, Gaza. I mean, Homs. My country is a number. Like, it is 1990. My mother is crossing a border. I mean, desert. I mean, life. I am at her heels. I am paying attention. I mean, I am learning to pray to a flag. I mean, I am learning English. I mean, I am forgetting Arabic. Or, it is 1994 and I am falling in love with a white boy, a habit I will never kick. Or, it is 2003 and I am in Beirut, watching Baghdad burn because of America. I mean, I am in my country, watching my country burn because of my country. Or, it is 2016 and who saw it coming? Some saw it coming. Or, it is 2019, and the women in Beirut are a sea. I mean, my country looks beautiful in red. I mean, I look beautiful in red. I mean, this country likes me in red. Or, it is every year, and my country is taken. I mean, my country is stolen land. I mean, all my countries are stolen land. I mean, I sometimes am on the wrong side of the stealing. My country is an opening. I mean, bloom. I mean, bloom not like flower, but bloom like explosion. My country is a teacher. I mean, do you want to see my passport? I mean, do you like my accent? I mean, I stole them. I mean, I stole them. I mean, where do you think I learned that from? Thank you. Hi, my name is Bushra Rahman and I'd like to read a poem called Corona and I'm not talking about the virus and it's dedicated to my hometown of Queens. Corona and I'm not talking about the virus. I'm talking about a place that is a little village perched under the number seven train in Queens between Junction Boulevard and 111th Street. I'm talking about the Corona Ice King, Spaghetti Park and PS19. The Corona F. Scott Fitzgerald called the Valley of Ashes as the Great Gatsby drove past it on his night of carousal, but what me and my own know is home. And we didn't know about any Valley of Ashes because by then it had been topped off by our houses. You know, the kind made from brick, this tan color, no self-respecting brick would be at all. That's Corona. I'm talking about Flushing Meadow Park, home of worlds for our relics, where it felt as if some ancient tribe of white people had lived there long ago. It was like our own Stonehenge, our own Eastern Island sculptures, made from a time when the city and the whole country were imagining the world's future, back when the future still seemed exciting and glossy, like some kind of stainless steel science fiction movie, not now, when the future seems like the inside of a dark coat sleeve. I'm talking about Corona, under the shadow of Shea Stadium, where brown men became famous and moved to Long Island, where our brothers played baseball in the tar schoolyards on the weekend. Back then, our brothers' futures were so open, and they were so close, they all dreamed the same dream together. That with a crack of a bat and the pull of their screeny brown legs, they could run away from the smell of garbage, the fear on the streets, the boys beating them up when they came out of the mushes in the evening. They could hit that bat, and it would land them all the way into the safety of Shea Stadium, and then pass that into the island that was long and rich, where all the baseball stars lived. This kind of fire. The gods did not make me a lapu-lapu leader rebelling against colonial invaders in loincloth and dagger. The gods did not make me the Broadway star of my own solo show, Reggie's Cry for Help. The gods are not going to wed me with a jillionaire gigolo with a smoking bod and eyes that soak the yuletide log of my girly girl lust. And I accept that. I live a life of a solitary poet, getting children to hyperbolize their superpowers and super selves, arming myself with a Greek mass of tragedy and comedy on the stage, eventually arriving home alone to a labyrinth of books on my black floor. 
Now the gods plopped me into the hot spots of a pandemic, inciting a fire of poetic epiphany, writing spells of self-deprecating humor and spiraling witticisms of a truth welded in pain so that we may climb a ladder of laughter up a grieving underbelly of despair only to find us crawling through a wormhole of uncertainty and the poems are a torched way out of the dark maybe the gods are watching my every move seeing what i do following me on their own social media live streaming my every action at this time for their amusements i do not write for the gods entertainment I write to be heard as a child of Filipino immigrants who had go-home scraped on their cars. I write for the Broadway play or Netflix special I'd never be cast in. I write for my muse who gifts me metaphors and whacked out lyrics and holds me tight in a flood of night sweats. I write to steady my anxiety of this unknown where pink elephants are popping like viral balloons in this new pandemonium. I write to get through the unquenchable fire, but now I am simply writing, foot on pedal, stomping the April chill of death. Hi y'all, I'm Tarfia and this is I Told the Water. I told the water, you're right. The poor are broken sidewalks we try to avoid. Told it, the map of you folds into corners small enough to swallow. I told the water, you only exist because of thirst. But beside your glistening membrane, we lie face down in dirt. The first time my father threw me into you, I was hieroglyph, a wet braid caught in your throat. I knew then how war was possible, the urge to defy gravity, to disarm another. I knew then we would kill to be your mirror. You black-eyed barnacle, you graveyard of windows. I told the water last night I walked out onto the ice wearing only my skin. You couldn't tell me not to. Thank you so much, y'all. Hi, my name is Stacy Ann. I am Jamaican, I am Chinese, I always, feel a little odd like an imposter saying Chinese because I had very little to do with my father so I have very little connection to my Chinese heritage. I'm a New Yorker living in the, this moment, this crazy pandemic moment in New York. The poem I'm reading is called Letter to My Father. It can be found in the collection Crossfire by uh, a litany of survival. Letter to My Father. Father, the A train is late again. Only moments to spare and I find myself thinking of you. Pencil tall in my memory, looming a full five feet from the ground. Rain pelting into me, slicking strands of hair to my aching neck, urging me to hold you responsible for the aborted weddings, the whispered stories about my mother, the gaping secret she tried to take with her to Canada. I feel it now, digging into my memories, infant bruises, bleeding muddles in my mind if I pause for more than the Manhattan minute, inking my pen with nostalgia, mocking my accent in America, the immigrant chewing the chalky flesh of an imported mango. On days like this, you invade this need I have for women, to swallow air with them, breathing backs curved taut against frightened bellies. Silver spoons slipped easy into each other, reflecting the fury of the faces that are never quite sure why they fit together so well and why the rightness of that geometry is so very hard to defend. On cold days like this, I yearn for the space between my grandmother's knees, the ancient smell of the amniotic soothing as she pulled the tangles from my hair. With you, it was always winter. Your white skin, thin and yellow, showing me the ice inside. 
On gray days like this, I want to make you see that I am an excellent housekeeper. Hear me speak out for little girls. Know that I consort with rampant homosexuals to taste the sorrow of women who have not yet found their voices. Beneath this thin sheet of ice, I want to beg you to look close at this girl who moves with the grace of a duck. Ankles turned in just like you, shoulders never quite straight. Look now, father, for soon she will be gone. This girl loved by men who gave of themselves in bracelets and blood and being, walked in unholy places because they believed in me. They never quite measured up to what I imagined you to be. Men always too sensitive or too brash, wanted too much or too little, always fell short of your rejection money spent regular, exact figures on shore. I collected the stenciled square on the first of every month, I carried it careful, a delicate confetti flake. I caressed it, fleshy thumb against flat paper until your signature was almost invisible. The bank cashed it anyways. Everybody knew. And Father, I know you will never be proud of me. And I might someday stop trying to make you out of this lettered train, rushing across the torn and twisted tracks of this runaway daughter's recollection. Until then, I live in New York City, and there is so much to be done here. The city always moving fast, and me, I'm just doing the best I can to keep up. I want to thank all of tonight's artists for their words and their time. Thank you to our friends at PEN America for helping make this week's events possible. And thank you to all of you for joining us tonight and supporting our work. The fight against hate does not end today, but by standing together as allies in solidarity, we can take one important step closer to turning the just and inclusive society of our imaginations into a powerful new reality. Again, thank you for joining us. Be well, stay safe, and we'll see you soon.